Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tone Aries podcast. I'm joined as always by my good friend Timmy Long. Hi everyone. Sean is on the light and sound. Why are you Sean? Not too bad, how are you? I'm not too bad. And our social entrepreneur Ireland friend is here with us in the hot seas. Eileen, how are you? I'm really good. That was a lovely intro, thanks. Congratulations on your award. And yeah. right back at you. Yeah, so for people that don't know, uh, there was five different projects selected for a 20,000 grant from Social Entrepreneurs Ireland. The Tone Aries podcast was one. And here, together, your project was zero. So congratulations. But before we get into that, we go right back so people get to know you a little bit. Where where are you from? I'm from Ballymun. I mm-hmm. um, grew up there. Um, yeah, went to the Irish school there um, back in the 90s. Um, I had good times, I had bad times. You mm-hmm. know what Ballymun was like back then. Yeah. You're our third um, Ballymun guest. Ah, so. Yeah, we're Shawnee Kinston and Willow White. Shawnee, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Willow White. Willow White. He's a comedian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're the two lads and interesting men. A lot of yes. stuff going on yeah. in Ballymun at the moment. Recovery yeah. month is a big thing about. It's a crazy place. Yeah. Like We recorded a few podcasts last year in the Axis Theatre up there as well. Good. I heard Sean. He's yeah. done a little bit with. He's yeah. flying at the moment. He was, really on, he was on one of the Sunday papers the other day. He's doing a triathlon for the P- Peter Mac Ferry Trust. Yeah, and he does the wellness. Yeah. He came into the school yeah. with me to the kids. And he was down here a few times with us as well. He done a, he done a, a triathlon, mini tri- triathlon for Cork Penny Dinners to raise funds for them. Yeah. And he comes down to the lads every once in a while. He came on the walk to his he way came on to the wider walk, education. Yeah, yeah. But so I was talking to him on the walk and he said that uh, when he came on the, the Two Hours podcast, uh, his business boomed after that because it gave him a platform you know mm-hmm. really and he got a lot nice. of work out of that people get to see, get to see him and then he goes into different organizations you know, doing workshops and talks and stuff like that so it's great you so know we're what I mean? one of them now yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah. it's good to have a female yeah a female from ballymun mm. come on share her story and so we can go back to where we started so we can go back growing up and if you want to even just go into any details about how it was growing up family if big family small family yeah so we were a big family we were kind of the posh ones we yeah. lived in the houses not the flats yeah. um there were six of us i'm second youngest and i was the only one out of six to mess with drugs Um, i started really early 12 had my first joint mm. 15 then i was taking ease and acid and i was a full-blown heroin addict by 16. Cool. did me fifth and sixth year in school like like that mm. so it's pretty tough mm. um Quite yeah not escalated easy. quick enough too didn't it really quick mm. and um it wasn't even my friends it wasn't i had to go find different friends that would do it with me it was it's a bit of a different story Um, i did it alone and tried to hide it a lot mm. as you do friends. there's yeah. probably a lot of shame around her and addiction yeah, back the in the time. day too yeah I don't know whether you remember, but there was a time when there was vigilantes. Concerned yeah. parents against drugs, marching the streets. It street. was horrific. Mm. And when I look back at that now, like I was 16, mm. 17, and I was selling heroin at the time, but I was still a kid. And they were um, grown adults shouting at you, screaming at you, throwing stuff at you. Like nobody that takes that is okay. Uh, like I wouldn't look at a 17 year old now or a 16 year old and think oh you scumbag or do mm. you know what I mean nobody that does that is okay but how, how like what what brought you into that world how how are you growing up were you a quiet kid like what way were you in um, school I loved primary school mm. I was like the model student um, great at camogie like had lovely friends and I think around like Ballymun was rough mm. Like, I mean, it was only later when I moved away and kind of went into treatment. I'll give you an example of what, uh, one bit that I look back at and I'm like, oh my God, um, the Gremlins is on, right? I'm yeah. like 10, 11. I remember. And I don't know what you remember. <laughs> I remember <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when RT used to stop for the news? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Jesus and Christ, I ran yeah. across to the little shop fan and um, to the little... Yeah. So containers yeah. that were shops ran across and uh, halfway between my house and the shop van a man fell in front of me fell off the flats he jumped off the flats but he was uh, 
<laughs> underground and he was twisted and you, you knew he was kind of dead and I was yeah. like oh my god that's so bad but I carried on and got me sweets and then went back and told everybody mm. that was really common do, do you know what it sounds like it sounds like something that my, we can relate to as well myself and James do you know when you grow up in an area where there's a lot of drug addiction mental health issues mm -hmm. crime violence when you hear of somebody that you know dying by suicide or murder or drug overdose it's an initial fright but you get on with it because you've learned to get on with it because it happened so frequently yeah mm. you think it's, it's kind of normal yeah, it, yeah. so it is the norm but where you if you live in a different area we won't say where but it doesn't matter it, it it's not that frequent and it really kind of shocks the whole community but where we are it kind of like you just have right sure. you just have to kind of pick yourself back yeah. up again don't you do you know what it reminded me of there when i was working in homeless service and, and hostel which can be quite violent at times and mm. shocking you know overdoses and st stuff like that there was this young fella came in he was eastern european he had very little english he was only about 18 and uh usually people like that when they come in they're fucking afraid and they'll mm. be shocked and there was one time there was somebody badly stabbed you know and he like he just walked and stepped over him didn't take a tackle didn't yeah. take it. and then you're, you're looking and you're thinking like wonder what his background is he's seen stuff like this before he just went on about his business he wasn't afraid or intimidated he just went on you know and that's what it reminded me of so you become becomes like it's just another day the violence becomes normalized doesn't it another time i could tell you um calling for me friend she lived in the flats and i went around and there was the guard of tape around the thing and obviously i got under it up the stairs i went but i slipped on a bit of what was like liver or something jesus christ the, <laughs> straight up the stairs saying oh you never guess what's after happening but found out later somebody got attacked with a thing you poked the fire with poker yeah so that was just that. like a little kid growing up like that like at the time you think and it was weird because we were from the houses and we were kind of my mom and dad worked yeah we should have been all right so it's you know what i mean you, you had friends and people you knew that knew were kind of messed up or whatever so in their, in their minds we, sh we should have been all right was your mom and dad stable they were working stable household no no well, well, stay working, but yeah. alcoholism and dysfunction and all of the rest that goes mm -hmm. with that, like, but never violence or well, um, yeah. But even in like in 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 the home where there's addiction, then in a the community, the wider area, there's lots of addiction and drug use. Very probably, or you're probably destined to take a drug at some stage, but to go into heroin use at such a young age is that common in Ballymun at the time or? Um, no, I was really young. Yeah. Like what I was. Um, Can you remember how you were first exposed to it? Yeah, I actually was, I got a part-time job in uh, Baggistry, mm. Quinsworth, I think it was called yeah. at the time. And I met a girl there and she, um, I didn't even know what it was. Like, I was really young, 15. Um, we went up to Stevens. I was fascinated with kind of drugs and mm. different things and... Um, so I've been taking ecstasy and stuff, but I didn't even know what heroin looked like to smoke it. Like, anyway, we went up to Stevens Green, and that was my first up in the toilets up there. Smoking. Yeah, and I literally got sick everywhere. I was green for the day, mm. but um, I still went back. I wanted to do it again, but it was like that. The feeling I can tell you what it was like. Even though I felt sick and I got sick, it was like someone just put like. A warm blanket around mm. you. It was oh, like, that, you? do you say that too? Yeah. There's yeah. nothing. There was. There's nothing like it. Like. Thanks to be the fuck I know. Like, you know. Whatever. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Like you look at someone that's in bits of hair and you think, ah, oh, Jesus God, love them. They don't care. They like. Mm. Comfortable in the shit. Yeah. yeah. And how did it escalate fr from there? Um. Oh. Like. I met a boyfriend and he was selling it, so it was really easy. And I started selling it. And, and was your heroin habit at that point after getting? Oh yeah, I couldn't wake up in the bad. morning. And there was a um, my parents found out I was messing with ease and stuff. They didn't think it was that bad, but um, yeah, they, they, I was really lucky. They sent me to Greece, so mm -hmm. we, we I went for three months in the summer holidays. 
What age were you then? Uh, 16, 17. Mm. Well, I was still in school, so it was the, the three months. Um, and it was there. I went kicking and screaming. I didn't want to go. I had mm. a sister, 10 years older, that was living there. Mm. And uh, yeah, I went over kicking and screaming. But it's where I got to see what kind of normal or different was. Oh. And it's when I started to kind of understand how messed up Bally One was mm. and how messed up situation was like um i still took drugs till i was 29 <laughs> and yeah. i oh yeah but did you go like after that trip to greece did you go back using her uh, yeah you yeah, did yeah so what did was that was more like respite so for rest for yeah and i would have called myself when i went into i would have said i was clean yeah. through these periods but i wasn't i was using everything else i was smoking hash every day yeah, and uh, taking coke and different stuff so was what never we, not taking drugs. What way was your life at home? Were you able to hide the drug use from your mum and dad? Um, or was it causing conflict? Or what about school? School, I'm really angry at school I went to, to be honest. Mm. Like, I was the last two years like that, and I was in bits. Like, they, they, there's no way they didn't know. Mm. Um, and I'm just glad that things are different now, that there's mm. you guys mm. m making yeah. awareness, people like us. Mm. Um, kind of making a difference because back at that time when I look back I feel really sad for there was no intervention yeah. I feel like nothing uh, in spite of probably loads I of red flags I was literally asleep on the table and everything like I'd be late all the time I'd be mm. like you could tell so yeah I, get, I get have a bit of resentment around mm. that like you had a lot going on for you you know a lot of uh, yeah. stuff going on for you back then so I used to get up in the morning go over to the block sell a batch mm. and me See, run home, get into my uniform, get a taxi down to school. Constantly, constantly <laughs> running and running and running. Entrepreneur. I young know, age. I was doing huh? that's like social entrepreneur at a young age. Yeah. Kick back at that <laughs> later when we go to the college <laughs> bit and um, <laughs> it served me yeah. well later on, yeah. but at the time it was horrific. Like yeah. and did you ever, ever before all that started like because uh, you seem like a quiet quiet girl, Bri. Yeah. Did you ever see anything like this happening before beforehand or, or like did this just completely take off and go off? I just loved drugs I yeah. loved heroin Me like too. so much it's like my I, best part I completely yeah. understand I loved cocaine and, 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 and prescriptive meds and James it was heroin you're just self medicating to block out yeah. The shit that's gone for you. Yeah. But the shit that was going on for me, like I was uh, diagnosed with clinical depression. I was yeah. in and out of Vincent's. I was in and out of counsellors. I was, there was something wrong with me, like, mm. and none of it worked. Like, they put me on medication. Um, so the side effects of some of the medication was worse than the, mm. so it was like I was trying, like I, I didn't want to be like that. Yeah. And I didn't want to be on drugs, but it's the only thing that made me feel half, yeah, half normal. Like mm. we, it's, it's like the saying goes. We we'll always go to the, the the one thing that makes us feel any bit normal. You know, um, like what the drink and the drugs used to give me, used to give me confidence, self esteem. You know, these were things that I didn't naturally have. Yeah. Without drinking drugs, and when I had these, it gave me the courage to go up and speak to women. Mm. You know, it gave me com all these different. I things that I didn't have and I suppose if you're getting that from using a substance and you're feeling good even the ecstasy back in the day I remember I remember the love that I used to feel I used to be f I'd kill you on a great. Friday and come a Saturday night after taking tweeze I could be fucking giving you hugs and kisses and everything you know so that you know, was a magic time that was uh, a magic time back I in the 90s yeah, yeah well, uh, the ecstasy like size and the ninety, the, ni the early nineties, yeah, nineties, late nineties, early nineties yeah. for me. But blind by the, the podcast of the day was it was about something random, no. But he spoke about uh, Mitsubishi chunkies, Mitsubishi yeah, ecstasies. Right you know, that was the first day I took. The doves, the fucking doves. Yeah. The doves is before my time, now. The speckled doves, then. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're showing your age now, lads. Back then, man, you <laughs> twenty pound in yeah. 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 But you'd be fucking twisted by. For for 10 hours well, like the, the said, great value the great value <laughs> 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 I woke up in a ditch one morning with a fox in front of me standing there <laughs> I was after getting chased by the girls through the fields uh, I'm lucky you know my heart didn't explode running through the fields right and this is factual yeah. I got into the ditch anyway and I curled up because they were 
up and down the ditch, up and down the ditch, up and down the ditch, and I was inside the ditch, and I was like, Jack, oh, crap. I must have nodded off, or else went into cuckoo land, you know, where... <laughs> Next, any anyway, I popped the head up around the knees to see where, where they gone from around the ditch. There's this fella, two ears cocked that way and the two legs in front of him, and he's staring at me straight into the eye. <laughs> like, this fella would have devoured me, you know. I was a young fella at the time. I was about 15 or... I was about 15, 14 or 15. I wasn't a big kid, no, or nothing at the time. And I just tried on. Because I, I just put the head back down and I just... I just left them off. Do you know what was fucking... That was, that's Best one of my ecstasy stories, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. You know, but, but uh, madness. Do, do you know, with the, with the heroin, did you yeah. stay using the heroin or did you move away from that as you matured? That was always my... my where I ended up. Yeah. yeah. And every time I went back to it, it got worse. And in the end, it was heroin and crack. Mm. And oh, I yeah. had a daily habit. It was anything from... 300 to 700 euro whatever I had like uh, people don't believe you when you say oh, that I believe it trust but me. it was that mm. much um, have any kids? two what ages? they're 17 and 13 how so did you manage that? when I got pregnant the first time I actually uh, met Leah's dad in Greece and we were together for I think probably 10 years um, when I was pregnant I stopped smoking and everything mm. it was like to the fact that I had somebody else. Yeah, yeah. that's actually very common. I, I, c- I couldn't even yeah. smoke a fag. Like, mm. um, Just the maternal instinct I kicked in. Like. Seriously, no. Um, like, when she came out, I was outside the hospital having, <laughs> fag, <laughs> having yeah. a cigarette, but I didn't use till mm. she was probably one. And I just got all that stuff back. Mm. Like, the, the thing of being responsible for another little human as well, like, that was... Overwhelming. And I moved into Belcamp. I bought a house in Belcamp Crescent. I don't know whether you know that place up in Priorswood. Is it a quiet area? Is there a halt inside up that way? Oh my God. Yeah, I, I think we I swear to God, you think you come from Ballymore and you've seen it all. This yeah. was... Patrick McCann, traveller we'd on the podcast, lived in Belcamp. I'm telling you, I so never yeah. 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 experienced anything like it in my life. So we bought a lovely four bedroom house knew the area was dodgy but you kind of think mm. you're from Bali mm. you kind of probably cope with it um, it was horrific he'd wake up to exploding tyres mm. many nights one night there was a day after stealing an ambulance and um, mm. rallying That's around the green yeah. in an ambulance that um, is fucking mad no idea mm. it was a heroin den so I started cutting a couple of the local lads hairs and stuff and just Ended up back yeah. full blown. Mm. Sure, as soon as you get that feeling back, I you know, know that feeling, it's like that's it, and it's not, it's way faster the second time. You pick up where you left off with it, with more. interest. Yeah. yeah. So that it's savage. It like. Up, like, mm. like that's one fear I have, James, around anything like that. Going back to where I left off is a week or two away from death. That's it. Do you know what I mean? I know. You know and when they're telling you that, you don't really believe it. But when you experience it, it's like that's it was exactly mm. like that. And you were functioning at that time as a, as a, a job, like, do you a, know a mother, what? a partner. When I found it looked great from the outside, yeah. but like um, when I found um, hairdressing, mm. that gave me something different. That gave me. It was the first time. I felt confident. I was really good at it. Um, I got to kind of... It's the first time I didn't want to use. Mm. Um, I got into a lovely shop. I started training. I moved up really quickly. Got to do some really cool stuff. Um, and I just loved it. I'd stand behind that chair in the morning and I would be a different person. Like, and I used to have panic attacks going to work. Half, I, sometimes I had to get off the bus halfway mm. to work because i get that anxiety. But behind the chair, I was like... Yeah. Um, so that was a new feeling. I found something, so obviously I latched onto that as well, and I became a really amazing hairdresser really quick. Do you know that feeling you spoke about there? The heroin took that away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Today you don't have that feeling. I don't have that no, feeling. Without the drugs, because we heal. Yeah. Through doing work on ourselves, don't we? I call myself recovered now. Yeah. I don't think I'm recovered from drug addiction but I still have work to do like mm-hmm. I still 
struggle with relationships and like little As, like everybody in the room here <laughs> mm. you know but you know what like uh, i actually went back to therapy probably about three four weeks ago mm. um like working down here together being super busy you know you're kind of neglecting yourself so yeah. not that i even wait till that till i feel i haven't wanted drugs in so long now and um, because i have my life full with Mm. great stuff and you're doing absolutely amazing things with your life today and that will be the next thing you're going to tell us about uh, what is here together and how it started it started from um in the GAA club I went mm. back playing Camogie after what's the GAA club Satanta GAA in Ballymun um, I was after going through a really rough breakup I met Lily's dad in rehab mm. we were together for probably what six rehab years what rehab were you in Ashley, Oh, that's in Tipperary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I went to Detox Five Forest over to Leeds to. Uh, I couldn't actually get into mainstream help here. I couldn't yeah. get. I found it really hard to get help mm, here. That's the problem. Mm. I swear to God, all I wanted to do was get well. Like I had a, had a kid. I had had a counselor that um pulled a few strings and got me into soil shit in mm. the town. Yeah, a place yeah, called yeah. Soil. So it's like a day program. Yeah, and it's like all you have to do is give like two or three clean urines a week, and mm. sure, I couldn't do that for love nor money. Like, no. mm. I was so confused. I felt bad letting him down because I couldn't I give two or three, and he was he was after get do me a favor to get me in. So I was so confused. Um, so there's this place detox five in Leeds. I think it was something like six grand, five six grand to go over and to basically knock you with wow. horse tranquilizers. <laughs> five days really um and i came back in bits like i think i was like barely seven and a half stone going over i was staying me coming back in the did your family do, did your f all your family know what was going on at this point my sister knew my mom knew there was i wasn't right but she they didn't tell her till i was gone mm. um, what age were you 20 29 mm. It's a full grown adult. <laughs> mm -hmm. I sold me house. Probably visually. Split, yeah. You know, uh, and physically, but I think. Yeah, but they weren't going to, they nearly weren't going to do it. I flew over. Um, and I was after being hospitalized twice. As soon as I started taking crack, that was it. My health literally mm. went down the tubes really, really quick. Um, mm. The crack cocaine has that effect. Do you want to explain a little bit about the crack and how, what it does to a person? So it's like the heroin really doesn't work after a while and you can take as much as you want and it just stops you being sick, really. Um, you just can't function without it. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the crack was totally different. Like you'd, you can, there's no entity amount you can smoke mm. and it's just straight away you get that kind of euphoria and then you're doing that and then you're smoking heroin at the same time so my lungs were in bits mm. literally like uh, I couldn't even breathe properly but in my mind I was never really a real addict and I was never supposed to be like that so I never injected mm. the doctor was always trying to get me on methadone I still didn't I don't know what was wrong with me I probably should have mm. <laughs> I don't you I must have had a lot of days sick I still don't know yeah. that yeah yeah that's not nice is it no I stayed away from methadone for a long time as well because a lot of my friends were on methadone, but they were they were still using gear, you know. Mm. And I was I always added in my head that as bad as I am on the gear, one five or six days they are locked in a room and I'd be fine. But I knew if I went on methadone that I was kind of accepting it that this is going to be it for me. Same, and I wasn't yeah. willing to do that. Oh, me neither. But eventually I did go on methadone. But it was for a short period of time, actually, to get into a detox. Mm. That brings up the other point I wanted to say. The threshold to get people into treatment is too high and the lack of detox beds is, is terrible so there's one detox facility in carlo where i was uh san francis mm -hmm. farm they detox from from methadone and benzos but like it's so hard to get in there i was actually up there a few weeks ago to visit the treatment center myself and a couple of my friends and the detox was closed down and i had been for a few weeks because they had no gp and there were about 500 people on the waiting list for it. And there's nothing like it in the country. Ridiculous. Fuck. I think it's mental. It's like, I was so confused back then. I was like, I'm ready for help. Like, mm. And then I came back from that place and I couldn't get into Ashori. 
because I was on all sorts of medication coming back. Do you know when you're ready for help like that, right, the difference between life and death is, is hours and days. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, and that's all you have because, like, you could OD, you yeah. could, some, some people take their own lives because they can't handle it anymore. I don't know if you're if you're in a care like at you the stable accommodation at this time. Yeah. But there's people then that are in homelessness. I can't How can imagine. you actually get them stable enough to give three orings over the course of a month mm-hmm. when they're living in complete chaos and there's no safety or structure? Yeah. Like it's you know, this so so stacked against them. They're actually better off going to jail for a few months and then kinda of trying when they get out. But then the problem is when they get out, it's back into the cycle of it again. But you sold your gaff in bell camp. Good riddance, as you. <laughs> I <laughs> made a nice price on it, though. I actually yes. bought it in 2004 and sold it in 2008. Good time to sell a house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was really good. So it was a good start. I had a good start, and I knew what I was doing with the money. I was literally just getting So that's 14 years ago? Yeah. 14 years. That's a good good time, like. Yeah. And yeah. M- what did you do when you came out of Ashery? Um, like I broke up with the group okay. Lily's yeah. dad and um, I'm sure I came out with Lily's dad. I was never my own since. Yeah. Um, and he was from Waterford, so we moved down there. We were both in recovery. Um, I did like that to four weeks in Ash Irie and I went in thinking, sure, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I always had in my mind I wasn't that bad for some <laughs> reason. Like you say, I'm, I'm quiet. laughing because of the of, uh, how how much I, I can I relate. Wonder, yeah, yeah. Like I should have been locked up loads of times, yeah. but I think it's because I'm yeah. soft and yeah. whatever. Like I got away with blue murder. Like so, um, yeah, moved to Waterford. Stayed down there for a few years. Yeah, had Lily, um, and it was going good. Like, but I was getting better. Yeah. And he didn't. Yeah. So. Just make a call then. Yeah. Sometimes it can be a very tough call too, can mm. it? Can be is is an even change for somebody to have to put so much change into their lives, and and that might even be a relationship, and then having to move back to Dublin and. That was horrific. Yeah. Like it literally, I loved it down in. Mm. Well, it was so a beautiful hard. city. It was one of the it hardest nice. things I ever did, and I did it clean <laughs> um. so I had no but you know what that's where sport and hair comes actually I went driving mm. trucks did you I went on a mad one Jesus you just have to throw in some <laughs> snowball into it there <laughs> driving trucks whatever I have in my mind I'll do it so basically it was just a distraction when, I, get, when I moved back up I hadn't settled in a salon properly yeah. and um, long story short got my artic license and <laughs> did it for a few no, years no for anybody who can't see Eileen here right Eileen's about what, five foot five, Very five good. or six, yeah. and she's a lady. You know, I couldn't picture her now with her um, like done that, degrees, <laughs> yeah, and, and I took and honking the horn there, some <laughs> bad driver next door. I know, yeah. And I took no crap from them out, <laughs> fellas that have been moaning about a day in the truck, a day in the salon, it's way yeah. harder. Well done. Do you know, you, you raised a good point there, because people in treatment centres, this is shown in some treatment centres and stuff like that. Um relationships in treatment centres and now early recovery even but especially in treatment centres they're not advised for the reason that you experience because w- if you have 10 people in a, a group in a treatment centre the the relapse rate is very high and if you get involved in a relationship in that environment probably one of you is not going to make it you know one of you is probably going to go back using you know and it, it just and it becomes it, it can become into a codependency and your recovery is based on somebody else where you have to kind of stand on your own two feet you know yeah they did everyone told everyone warned warned us mm-hmm. um and they even wanted me to go to a place called renew down in oh yeah. that's what we're from they, yeah. but is it yeah. yeah they told me basically in a group setting and there's me thinking i'm not that bad because yeah. i still have this vision that i'm nice and soft and i'm not really like mm. yeah the others but they basically in a group told me you have no hope after four four weeks here and we'd like you to go to renew they got the family in the everyone was saying it's mm. fine go mm. we look after leah but i knew in my heart and soul it was going to be okay i knew whether i was deluded and i'm okay because i just believed it or i don't know 
I just knew I was going to be all right, so I didn't go. So how long were you more for the what age when you went back to Dublin? Um, when I got clean, 29 to 2015, I came back, so. Mm. Mid thirties. Yeah. And did you go back to Ballymun? Yes. Back to the family home? Yes. What was that like? It was, it was really it was a really sad time. I was up and down to court. Mm. Like it wasn't an easy break up with a bar okay. in order and it was really awful. Like mm. um the kids were so upset they didn't want to go either and like I'll cry even thinking about it. Can be tough. That was sounds like it was a tough period. We were so like settled, like yeah. lovely neighbours. Mm. Um they told me after um, when I got out of treatment, one of my things was I wasn't allowed to work part of my recovery because sometimes I use that uh. as a thing so you're not to work for two years and I couldn't help it I started blow drying the local neighbour <laughs> and, like, and how did you start hair together tell us what about tell us what hair together is it's a 10 week program we run where we teach hairdressing and barbering but it has a wrap around personal development program yeah, that's so, a massive part of it, isn't it? Oh, huge. Um, but they come for the hair, mm. but they get well more than that. So basically, uh, I got the inspiration from, I'm a session stylist as well, so I get to travel around and do fashion shows, like pa Paris Fashion Week, Copenhagen Fashion Week. And the company I work for, they're called Kevin Murphy, and they're, I love their culture. I love everything about them. Like, they're... They're different. Mm. They're, it's like a community. It's like a family. We don't even call them workmates. Or it's mm. like a family. So I kind of took that experience that we have backstage and how we work together, how we get on and kind of how we have to be to work backstage in into the programme. So, yeah, they learn hairdressing and barbering. And the end goal is that they have to uh, produce a model. So they learn a new skill every week. And then um, they do a catwalk style fashion show. So we get models, oh, makeup artists, videographers. So it's a whole experience. Um, and like that, we've had interest from addiction centres too. I think it's perfect for someone coming out of that because they, you know yourself, when you come out, you have nothing. Your boredom kicks in. You you know what it's like. These, these boats we're in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But even like for... For people in prison, I think it would be great as well. I was down in Shelton yeah. Abbey. Giving them a great skill. Like yeah, they and they it's were, like something yeah. that they can they, they can be independent with, with it and earn money when they get out. Yeah, but like we complement any course they're going to do. So they find that like hairdressing and barbering and tattooing is the kind of big things that prisoners or addicts go towards. Mm. But it's actually harder than they think to do. So we're kind of the programme that will give them the excitement or the yeah. experiential learning journey so that when they are going through their real training they'll kind of tap into that and remember like that feeling I got that I kind of yeah. and it's a gr it's a great industry and you're changing lives yeah because I know a lot of them are young people as well that's how that's yeah. who we're with now at the mm. moment we're working with a group of uh, young people from Tuesday mm. that's lovely and it started off in the GAA I was vice chairperson mm. when I was truck driving trying to keep myself busy um, on the move back to Dublin and um, there was two or three lads and they were selling crack cocaine and they were 13 and 14 and like literally it broke my heart I, was like, I just can't believe this is going on now mm. still since the 80s and yeah. it really hit me I was like what can we do like so we made up the best program which was kind of bringing education and sports together within the club to keep them interested in the winter months um, so they wouldn't be hanging around the streets and whatever. So we did cook them with them and we brought them to the gym and then the hairdressing and barbering something I can give them. So I was like, could you give them blades and, mm. <laughs> and stuff? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, pal of mine, um, he's in recovery too, Tony, he's part of hair together. I said it to him, he's like, 100% bring them up. And the first night we had, um, we had some uh, kids from Satanta and the Poppentry Youth Action Project that were interested in barbering. Um, and they just loved it. The first night, like me and Tony were super busy. 
and we just knew from that night that we had something magic and mm. we just had to find a way to to do it so we didn't set out to make her together it just kind of happened happened and yeah. you know when things like that happen and they become what they are now mm. they're supposed to be 100 they're supposed to be i know? literally changed everything went back to college left mm. my job um i kind of thought that i was stupid because i didn't finish school properly i did but I, I didn't i don't even remember it really to be honest um so I went back to do to Ballsbridge College for their education to do business, and I was, I realised that I'm doing business my whole life. Yeah. Like I thought I'd have to start from the bottom, mm. but I'm really smart that way. Yeah. I just didn't have the. The credential to go with so it. So that gave me huge confidence, kind of knowing that I understood what was what happened in the business world and. Yeah. Um. I went on then to do DCU, um, organisational management, commu- community organisational management, and got a distinction in that. Mm. Like, mm. Wow. <laughs> so your confidence is like, starting to build yeah. now as well here. So I can, and I'm yeah. doing it. Like and you're changing core mm. beliefs in, within yourself as well. We won a global award, mm. the Kevin Murphy Icon Award. That was like over 100 applicants globally. Jesus. You're here together, wouldn't that? Yeah. Just there, we were. They flew us to Berlin. Mm, congratulations! It was unreal. Did the kids go over with you as well? No, it was just yeah. us. Just the yeah. girls. Um, but they came over and they visited Ballymun. Yeah. So you had the MD of Kevin Murphy and the um, the global strategic mm. manager, and the they had a style master. So she's like one of the big heads in the company. Come over, and we were in Ballymun, and we got three of the different groups together. Yeah. They wanted to see what a hair together class was like. Mm. And the whole community chipped in. We were up in the Aspen student accommodation. They have like a rooftop terrace. Mm. Um, and they had a class. So we had kids from Trinity Comp, the comprehensive. We had the first ever pilot group assistant. So they were assisting. Mm. So they were, th- once, you, once you're with us, you know, with us, you'll either come back to model or you'll come yeah. back to help. Or yeah. So it's like that community kind of thing. You're, you're never gone. If you want help going forward, work experience, jobs or whatever, we're there as well. We have huge support from the hair industry as well. That's great. Is there anything like it outside of Dublin? Do you know anybody else doing something similar? I mean, my own little, we're in our own little bubble. I yeah. actually, like, I'm so busy. I don't yeah. get a chance It's a great to idea, though, for somebody to replicate. Uh, like, yeah. if it works well in Ballymun, it'll work well in Knockneheny or my Ross or anywhere. Works well already in Cavan and, like, What's we've... And, that, and th- uh, that's, that was my next question. What yeah. are the plans for here together going forward? So we have big plans, like, yeah. definitely going national and we're not ruling out going global too quickly yeah. either because does it with that in that global stage mm. there's lots of hairdressers asking how do you do that what do you do what do you do how mm. do you do it so mm. that's all in there now five year plan what does it mean for you and your organization to get the grant from the social entrepreneurs Ireland? that was literally like mm. you know how hard it is trying to juggle everything like and you know it's worth it so you keep doing it yeah. and i nearly didn't apply for that the application was tough now. Very no, tough application. So for James, I looked at it, I was there for a night, and I'd, uh, I'd stay up for about six or seven hours, and I couldn't even get something on the page, and James just just sorted it out. He's good with the applications. But the application but was tough. There's a, a Zoom interview, then there's an in-person interview up in UCD. It's a long application process, but when you get it then, it's like, fucking hell, this didn't come easy, yeah. you know? And they d- know we're yeah. worthy of it. Like it, they oh know yeah. they're going through that. R- and do you know what we we both found as well? Do you know the people that are involved? With S- they're absolutely Duh. amazing yeah. people, and they're all there for the right reasons. Mm. And even the people that they're going to put you in contact with, and us in contact with, and connect us all with. Yeah. That alone is worth. So more than outside 20. of the finance that they gave us, they give us a lot of other stuff as well. The mentorship and the coaching yeah. pieces, which are vital for up and coming entrepreneurs, and I even feel we are saying that because we never really started this out as a business, just kind of happened, do you know, mm. just happened. Yeah. <laughs> but they spot that, like, yeah. and it's like it's so hard, and you're on your own, and like you're so busy with your own lives and mm. stuff that you don't get to explore that 
that was yeah. my like the last year of really seeing a whole other side to Ireland, I suppose, where there's loads of people like us out there. I know. And then you get that buzz kind of like oh. Isn't it great to see so much good within all our communities? But yeah. even the energy in that room yeah. when we went to meet everyone yeah. and they were lovely, weren't they? Yeah, but just like it's great. There's is support there. Yeah. Well But it's hard it was hard to find out about it or I know. I did work experience in um I got to do a really cool leadership pro- program, the Common Purpose Emerging mm. Leaders. Um and it was from there that I kind of that world started opening up to me, and that's where we got the job with Tusla. And, yeah. um, and see like the doors so are many to open cool it's people out there. Isn't it? The yeah. doors are starting to open. So you're in Cork this weekend. So what what brought you to Cork? So in my week, I wear three yeah. different hats <laughs> on my hairdresser. Yeah. I do my clients. I love that. I'll do it till the day I die. I don't care how. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just love doing hair, um, and then I'm an educator for Kevin Murphy. Um, that's who I do the shows with and travel so a bit. So that with, like a hairdressing so school. Um, that's like a brand. So yeah. then their distributors, National Beauty, they're there in Blarney. Yeah. Business Park. So they're they're doing great as well. Mm. They give us loads of support. They supply us with like all products, and yeah. they're our number one fans since mm. day one. So it's great. Great stuff. Um, yeah, so we're down there educating a lot of educators together. So you don't educate this weekend? This it's Yeah, so it was like they were educating the educators uh, and then we go off then to different parts of the country sharing yeah. sharing all the latest knowledge. Busy lady. You're a busy, busy, busy lady. Well, You're putting we, your... Yeah. What was I going to say? Should we, we'll bump into Jenny uh, in that event thing for the Social Entrepreneurs Ireland in November. And uh, thanks for coming over to meet us. It's lovely talking to you. And uh, thanks for sharing here. your thanks story as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, hi to everybody in Ballymun. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we've a bit of a connection with Ballymun now at the moment. Yeah. Might you'll, pop you'll up and get flats. a haircut the next year. <laughs> no uh, problem. Uh, but uh, thanks a million and thanks, Sean. Thanks, Eileen. See everybody next week.